and this is a great opportunity, and we talked a little bit about it yesterday, but the, the certification if you left is really helpful in many areas. One, in your credibility with your own employers. Number two, with liability, we're gonna, because here we're talking about risk management, and we'll do the formal introduction in a minute, but in risk management, you're always looking first to not you know, do no harm, but also we want to cover our tuchus. You know, we, we don't want to be liable. And the first thing is, how do you prove that you or your staff is qualified to do what you've done? And having the certification gives you a level of protection. So, you know, on a lot of levels, the certification is good and it's a, just a great opportunity to get that. So I hope everybody's... I think they're all, uh, almost everybody's left there. Perfect. Outside. So Excellent. we will get these filled out during the session. Just grab them as we've been doing at the end. The, um, the evaluation forms will be coming, I think, in at the end. Um, we have to turn out a few more. So don't leave without getting a form that you can fill out, please. Do I get to introduce myself? I'm not shy. <laughs> so excellent. Leah, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Mushet and I, it's also Johnson. <laughs> the, um, I, I, I stick pretty much with Mushet because um, I've been in the field now, I'm embarrassed, about four years. <laughs> about 40, 40, great. 4 zero, 40 years. Um, my my first uh, Paralympic experience was in 1976, and I started coaching in around 1970 um, athletes with, with disabilities, and have had the privilege of serving in, in many different roles and capacities, both here in the U.S. You know, being a chef de mission on the U.S. the U.S. team for Paralympic Games. But also, eventually, I became more involved at the international level because the, there were so many rules and procedures and the ways that nations received their slots, meaning how many athletes you can bring, things that were happening with classification or events being eliminated, that, that we that I, and also we in the U.S., were not necessarily in support of. We didn't think it was in the best interest of the movement. The only way to facilitate change is to become involved. And so eventually, I was fortunate enough to be nominated by the U.S. to run for election at the inter with the International Paralympic Committee. Um, and if you, how many, did y'all go to, to the governance session that Mike Mushet did. Some of you did, some didn't. Well, in just, and, and, and I'm not gonna digress, but in the sport for athletes without disabilities, <coughs> your governance for the Olympic Games, of course, is the International Olympic Committee, or we say the IOC. And then beneath that, you have sport-specific organizations. You've probably all heard of the IAAF, you know, which is for athletics, maybe the you know, ITTF, which is for table tennis, and you know, it, it kind of goes on. You've got, and then in each country, you have what we call an, an NGB, and that is the, the governing organization that oversees sport. And in the United States, is there, is, we've got, We've got Americans and international participants. Um, so I apologize, but in, you know, if you're not American, but it is good to know just a tiny amount about the history. In 1978, Congress passed the Amateur Sports Act. And the Amateur Sports Act was because we had two groups that were fighting in court over the governance of wrestling. Nothing to do with Paralympic sport. But, you know, I control wrestling. No, I control wrestling. And I should send the Olympic team. No, I should. And so, ultimately, Congress got involved and they passed the Amateur Sports Act. It was implemented in 1980. 
And it was not until 1982, it, we were able to get language in that legislation that said that the U.S. Olympic Committee, if, since the U.S. Olympic Committee was going to oversee or be responsible for the coordination and governance of all the money and don't be embarrassed. You must have to the gym, sorry. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> Remember, we've got places everywhere. Um, the governance of, of, of amateur sport in the U.S., and that should include the governance of sport or the oversight, the coordination of sport for athletes with disabilities. So it wasn't until 1982 that they created the, what they called then the Committee on Sport for Disabled in 1982. I'm so old that I had the privilege of being a member. <laughs> I represented cerebral palsy sport on that original committee. And so um, when it comes, if you ever want to know about how something came to be, whether it's logical or not logical, I can usually tell you. And I can also tell you all the gossip. <laughs> one day I will write a what they call it, a memoir and, 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 and huh? A tell, tell all. all. Well, not all. <laughs> so you have to be included in that tell all. <laughs> yeah, I, I was boring. <laughs> well, I guess it all depends. I never felt I was boring, but maybe other people did. Um, but the. Uh, my sort of my professional career, my professional training is a little bit diverse, and and um, I don't have ADD, but but I have come to understand that I find many things very interesting, and so I tend to pursue those. And I was a professor at Wayne State University for nine years where I coordinated and ran the therapeutic recreation or the recreation therapy curriculum. We had a medical school and we were actually positioned in, uh, we, did, we did a lot of clinical, I taught a lot of PT students. Um, I'm also a, cert a licensed certified psychotherapist. Um, when I got advanced degrees, I didn't want to get the same thing. And I was able to become certified as a sports psychologist um, because of that and had the opportunity while in Detroit to work with uh, the Detroit Tigers and the Detroit Red Wings, which um, are their professional teams. And that was, was not only a lot of fun, it was interesting. It was great for them because if a player had a problem, and sometimes those problems were performance related and sometimes those problems were not performance related. But if the press got wind of something, then because I taught sports psychology as well as recreation therapy and rehabilitation medicine at Wayne State, um, I, was, I was assigned across departments that it was, oh, you know, so-and-so's in a slump and is working on their performance and nobody ever asked any other questions. And so that was really a, a, a benefit, but it gave me the opportunity to learn an awful lot about high-performance athletes, about uh, injury, and about the recovery, particularly the psychological recovery from injury, and um, uh, just the, sort of how to apply that in Paralympic sport, because all during that time, I was involved in governance at the international level in Paralympic sport. And uh, even before IPC existed, the International Paralympic Committee. Uh, I then was a professor at Georgia State, where I taught sports psychology and therapeutic recreation for 11 years um, and, at, at Georgia State. So I've been in academia for 20 years. But even during that time, I was very involved in the field. I don't consider myself an ivory tower person. I was the technical officer for the International Paralympic Committee for two terms of office, elected by the membership. IPC has a, a each country has, uh, we have a general assembly with each member country. Each member country has a vote. You know, Nepal has a vote, US has a vote, uh, Ghana has a vote, and, and so forth. And was elected as the chairman of the sports council. Okay. I'm sorry, my Oh, okay. did, did I give you something? Yes. Perfect. I'm sorry. Excellent. Hope you feel better. 
And the, um, sorry, we'll talk about blood pressure <laughs> here, too, in risk management. So that was a good interruption there. It gives us sort of a caveat to what can happen um, in terms of risk, risk management. But as the technical officer of the International Paralympic Committee, I was the chairman of the Sports Council, and I oversaw the, each sport that's on the Paralympic program was on the Sports Council, and I oversaw everything from the officials to the venues to the how athletes qualify for the games to how slots or numbers are allocated. In other words, how is it that Australia, uh, this was a great controversy, Australia, who at that time had by far the best uh, cycling team in the world, only got uh, a third as many slots as Great Britain and the USA and, you know, things that were not, shall we say, you know, fair, <laughs> to be blunt, you know, but things like that. And I oversaw four Paralympic Games, winter and summer. Um, I, my background is in summer sport, so before my first big press conference went in Nagano, uh, Nagano, when we had a huge controversy, and I knew that the press was just going to just try to chew me up and spit me out. I spent the whole night reading the fist rule book because I needed to make sure that I knew the difference between the slalom, the giant slalom, and the super G. <laughs> and with a, with a summer sport background, being from Georgia, <laughs> yeah, the deep south, I needed, to, needed a little bit of, of studying. But all of the jokes aside, I tell you all of that because it's very important when you're speaking that your crowd under, sort of know a little bit about you so you have credibility. And so as you go out, because all of you are going to be teachers, you're going to take what you learn and you're going to be doing in-service trainings where you are. You may become and you will most likely be the expert in your area. In fact, I love one of my friend's definitions. It's a little dated, you know, I'm old. But the definition of an expert, you're an expert if you come from 25 miles away and you have a tray of slides. <laughs> I guess now that'd be a PowerPoint. Um, but you're an authority if you come from 25 miles away without a tray of slides. So I guess um, our speaker last night didn't have a tray of slides, so he must be an authority. <laughs> so, so, but I'm an expert in the field of risk management. But, um, I mean, this, uh, to be serious, this is an area of expertise that I have for many reasons. Number one, a top priority, and we have to remember this, especially when your bosses are talking to you, that our, our top priority always is do no harm. We want to do good. <laughs> you know, we want our programs to make a difference for people to be healthier, uh, happier, perform better, you know, all of those things. You know, we want to have a positive impact, but first and foremost, we want to do no harm. And I'll, I may mention words, and I'll explain them because we have a very diverse group. We have some people who've been in this for a long time and could probably be up here teaching this as well as I, as well as me. Um, anyway, you get the picture. Um, English I didn't major. So, <laughs> as well as I. Thank, thank you. But, but we also have people that, that have that fire burning, that, that know that this is something that is important, that it makes a difference, and you know that you have the capacity to change lives immediately. And it's, I get chills when I, literally when I talk about it because still we see it happen. And Jeff Jones, one of, one of our staff, texted me one weekend and said a little uh, eight, I think a little eight year old, not, I think eight year old kid on our wheelchair basketball team made his first basket ever. And I, I think I felt the same exhilaration that I felt you know, 40 years ago when I was coaching little kids because it redefines who they are. We define who we are. We say, you know, when, even when we meet people, you know, we've got all these meet and greets, you know, kind of thing. But children, as they develop a self-concept, it's, it's different from adults because it's sort of, who are you? I'm my mommy's daughter. You know, 
I'm my daddy's son. Who are you? Uh, I'm a Catholic. I'm Jewish. Who are you? They grow a little bit. I'm a first grader. I'm in kindergarten. I'm a kindergartner. You know, who are you? I'm a baseball player. I'm a cheerleader. You know, it changes and becomes more complex. When, for us, we have many different parts of sort of the who we are. You know, I am the CEO of Lay Sports America. Who am I? I'm a sports psychologist. Who am I? I'm a master's clinical social worker. Who am I? I'm a recreation therapist. Who am I? More importantly, I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a friend. All of those kinds of things. But, you, but the expert and the authority portion, you are going to be actually teaching this and implementing this. So first we want to do no harm. Second, please come on in. Don't go bad with the transportation people. I didn't want to have the door slam. Trust, trust me, yeah, I jump around and so it, it won't distract me in the least. We're friendly here. Yeah. And which makes me I was I don't do this. When you when you have bad experience, you swear you're never gonna do it. I was in tenth grade and I was taking chemistry with Mr. Morris. And I was trying so hard to do good. And when the bell rang, he closed his door and locked the door. And you could be standing outside the door and he wouldn't let you in. And you had to go to the assistant principal who disciplinary. So I swore that I would never lock my doors <laughs> when it was time. So you know, I don't want to be Mr. Morris. So. <laughs> um, we're talking about risk management and medical implications of disability. Now, you hear all the time great coaches, and great coaches will say to you, and, and just to back up a second, you know that Blaze Sports, that Blaze Sports and Paralympic Sport, and great coaches will say to you, this is sport. We, we coach athletes, we don't treat patients, things like that that this is just like able-bodied sport. And in 90% of the ways, that, that is the gospel. That's the truth. That is the absolute truth. However, every individual is different. And even as you coach athletes without disability, an expert coach understands that one person is taller, one person is shorter, one person um, is stronger, uh, one person may have fast twitch, slow twitch, uh, an, an athlete may have an incredible vertical jump if you're coaching soccer, for example, and that athlete may be small and have an amazing vertical jump, and so the, another athlete ha doesn't. No matter how much training, people are different. And people with disabilities have certain differences that we must know about. If we don't know about them, we are negligent. Because in addition to doing no harm, you need to make sure that you are, you are protecting yourself and your organization. I've been sued five times. Now that's in 40 years, that's not too bad. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm being absolutely serious. Um, my first lawsuit was probably the most traumatic, and I'll never forget, I gave a speech in Bemidji, Minnesota, and uh, I made, I was, uh, it was about youth programming, and I said, I was talking about, about teaching skiing, you know, this is in Atlanta. And, and they, I was showing pictures. Now we had this like really steep hill that we had put astroturf on, and then we put these little five, these little beads on it about the size of BBs, and then you would breeze them 
and you grease the bottom of the skis, and then you wet it all, and then we teach people to downhill ski. <laughs> and then at the bottom, there would be, of course, bales of hay and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and then, and people were looking at what is that? And I'm telling them, so the Menji, Minnesota, they didn't really quite get that. And then I would say, and then I said, but, but once a year, I'd take them up north, you know, to go skiing. And they said, well, where'd you take them? I said, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> where there was like real snow, you know, in the mountains and, you know, things like that. But one of the blind girls hit the, um, hit the bales of hay. Now, I'm talking 40 years ago or 35 years ago or something like that. So, so things have changed since then. We hit the of hay, paper arm. So her parents sued me and the school system I was working for um, because they said that it wasn't appropriate for a blind girl to be skiing. And so it, it, in the hearing, sort of like all the depositions that go on before, I had, of course, a lot of witnesses, and they weren't saying that it was negligent to have them skiing on extra turf. <laughs> but it was just that it was an appropriate activity, and so that was really easy. That was an easy one to sort of get thrown out of court. And, um, and there have been a, a variety of other things. Some of them I made mistakes, some of them I didn't, and I... I, you were in Texas in, in 1982 or something. Right? The, um, we, went, we had a national championship in Texas. You can't remember This guy, if he could blackmail me. <laughs> yeah, when I'm sitting up here, I'm an expert because I have a PowerPoint. And when he came in late, I said, expert, if it comes from 25 miles away with straight of slides, you know, and, and the authority comes without slides. But we had the national championships were at Texas Christian University. And, and so I'd been in, and, and I was in charge, and I'd been in many times, and yeah, they had people going build ramps, because this was before the ADA. I arrived on site, and those ramps were like ski jumps. I mean, we put everything down to keep you sliding. And four people pushing up one chair with good tread on your shoes, and you still fall backwards. I mean, this was, you would not, well, I talk about not being built to go. The veins were right there, you know. And, and so, of all things, the only ramp in the entire campus that met code, and a girl that lived in the walk, and we had several palsy walk, lived in an apartment that was many stairs up, decided to walk down the ramp that actually met the code, and, and she fell and injured herself, had to go to the hospital, and so she sued. And um, we just, we ended up just settling out of court. It was just, it was, it was much easier. I mean, we may have won eventually, but she legitimately was hurt, and she legitimately had medical expenses, and she legitimately didn't have insurance, and we would have covered her medical costs anyway, and, but the suit was filed so fast that, that we did. And so part of risk management, number one, it's making sure that then, um, it is making sure that people don't get hurt um, to the degree that it's controllable, and then also protecting yourselves from, from potential uh, lawsuits. Now, understand that if you've got a track team with uh, track athletes, runners, that do not have a disability, People are going to fall, and they're going to skin their knees, and those things are going to happen. If you have runners with cerebral palsy, they are going to fall two, three times more frequently. So when we, I wish I had a blackboard, when we manage for risk, keep in your mind that we are managing primarily for two things. 
One is what's common. What is likely to happen? That means that people are going to fall. Uh, people are going to, uh, in a, a contact sport, may um, hurt their ankle. Uh, my daughter uh, plays, played Division I soccer, and it's very common to have knee injuries, and she just sustained her first career injury, even though she's a senior in college, first time she's ever had an injury, and she tore her ACL, and she in a game a couple of weeks ago, and that's common. So you plan for things that are, are likely to happen. So you have a doctor, <coughs> you have trainers, you have an ambulance when necessary, you know, on the side of the field. The other thing in risk management is that you plan for things that are not likely. One time in a million, this is going to happen. The example that I use is your seat belt in the car, in the automobile. It is unlikely, you drive every day. It's not likely that when you're driving home that you're going to have a head-on collision. It's, it's probably not going to happen. But if it happened, the outcome would be catastrophic. It would be devastating. So every day, every time we get in the car, we put our seat belt on. Every time we put our little baby or our child in the car, we strap them in to their little car seat. Because it's probably not going to happen. It's nothing's going to happen. that would be you know, severely brain injured, and so we do it every time. It's the same in risk management. So we manage the things that are, are probable, they're, they're going to happen. You can do everything right, everything, and somebody's going to get hurt. But if you've done everything right, if you get sued, you're not going to lose, number one. But you also manage for things that are Probably at the end you're going to think, we wasted that money. You didn't. Because if it had happened, then, and you had not been prepared, you would have never forgiven yourself. Now let's move on with the content. So we're managing risk, and we are, we can't eliminate risk. The risk is inherent in sport. So we can't eliminate it, we manage it. And medical implications. What's different about a person with a disability and a person without a disability? And that you've got to know. It's your responsibility to know. So I've already given you the program overview. We're just going to, I wish I had a pointer. Did I have a pointer? Center button. Center button. Yeah. Right in the, in the middle of the green. In the middle here? Yep. Yeah. That's what you're Technology's not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to identify risk factors. We're going to talk about how to minimize it. We're going to identify various disabilities and injuries or conditions that are common to both and how to handle them. So our areas of risk is sort of Again, and I'm going to reiterate this in the next one. The venue, you know, where are people, where are people going to get hurt? They can get hurt at the venue. Look at this crash. And these happen, and the, the better your athletes become, the higher performance, uh, the Parapan games that are going to happen in, in Guadalajara this year, at the London 2012 games, even maybe at your national games, you're going to see spectacular crashes, especially when athletes draft. So, you know, 
spectators, coaches, staff, athletes can, are all potential areas of risk. When you're preventing, you want to think about who can get hurt, where they're going to get hurt, when and how. The nearest brush with death that we have ever had with a U.S. national team was a coach, not an athlete. A coach fell down in Korea in 1988. A coach fell down the steps at the dorm that were concrete and had a head injury that caused seizures. And at that time in Korea, we felt like we were stepping back in time. And you, when you give medication for seizures, they could not give us the results of, of that for five days. And so the polyclinic was not able to get her seizures under control. And so Dr. Dr. Richter was a team doc, and I, um, I, I ran a rehabilitation hospital. I told you about the, the uh, working at the universities for 20 years at Georgia State University and Wayne State, but I also went, ran a rehabilitation um, hospital administrative director. And, and the way that we had to check, because we couldn't get the blood work back in time, but with medication for seizures, you know, the drugs for seizures, if it's a little bit high, you know, just a little high, not too much, but man, so <laughs> we would have, I just follow my finger. She's very healthy. <laughs> if the medication is slightly high, you get nystagmus. And what that means is that the eye, as it moves, it just sort of twitches just a little. And too much, it's too high. And so the way we checked her medication level was if we could get a little twitch, and it was a 24-hour flight getting back. When we got her back to Texas, we took her straight to the hospital. Her medication, the blood level was <laughs> they couldn't believe it. Dr. Richter is a, is a brilliant doctor. First time I gave her a shot, he said to me, Carol, you know, she's a person, not a cantaloupe. <laughs> I just do it too good. So, who? The who can be your coaches, your officials, your athletes, your volunteers, your spectators. You know, but where? Obviously in the dormitory. <laughs> when? In the middle of the night. Um, how? Let's not talk about it. <laughs> um, but where? It could be in the, track, the practice facility. It can be in housing. It can be in the practice facility. It can be on the field of play. It can be during play. It can be in the stands. And so when you're thinking about managing risk, you want to think about all of those things to minimize the chance of somebody getting hurt. Okay. Obviously, the venue. Um, and rarely do we have a venue like this. You know, like a Paralympic venue. You can tell that I worked at Wayne State University, which is in Michigan, because Michigan State Spartans. Go Green. Huh? Go Green. Woo! <laughs> yeah, I worked on my doctorate there. And the and so we we do a walkthrough. <laughs> Before you if you have any UAM fans here, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> that you do a walkthrough. You and or your you and your staff. So literally, you're gonna walk all the way around the track. You know, because you if there's a pothole, if there's a crack, if there's glass on there, if there are rocks, you want to sweep it. Um, uh, uh, Director General uh, Danielle Pierre Charles let us use, let the National Paralympic Committee of Haiti use his venue 
for the last year they did the national championships, the year of the earthquake. They had they didn't want to have the earthquake beat them. And so I mentioned yesterday in my remarks that thanks to his support and the leadership of the of Jean Chevalier with the National Paralympic Committee and many others, uh, Blaze Sports had the opportunity to help and support and to provide some funding so that the national event could go on. And they were at the venue before, I think before light, you know, sweeping the, 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 the we had a big rain, remember the rain the night before came. And so the basketball court had, you know, some mud and you know, you know, cleaning it up, making sure that things were as safe as possible. So you do your walk through, you particularly, and remember to check the bathrooms and, you know, all kinds of things like that. Water, is, and we're going to talk about dehydration later. You identify hazards. If, if it's a hazard you can't address, put a big cone around it. They can be your best friend. Block it off. Um, you know, is, are there facilities within the building? Is there a clinic? Are medical people there? Um, the, and we're going to kind of get to this, like making sure that you know where the, the local facilities are for medical care, um, that if we need to take somebody in to have their blood pressure checked, if we need to take someone in, uh, because it's not just a skin thing, they're going to need some stitches. And we'll talk about having the address and emergency contact of others later. You need to have the basics with you all the time. Now this is sort of kind of focusing on a competition, but this is practice too. Because remember, they can get hurt during training. And so you've got to have your first aid kit, and you need to make sure it's stocked. <laughs> it, it, it is so. You know, my, I think that the Blaze Sports staff is as competent a staff, certainly as I have ever had the privilege of working with. But nonetheless, there are times when Mara or I might take a peek in that first aid kit, and lo and behold, we're out of band aids. <laughs> You know, or we're out of an antiseptic spray or something like that. So you got to keep it stopped. Make sure you have a phone and that that phone is charged and that it gets a signal. <laughs> because if we're at Warm Springs, Georgia, oh my lord. <laughs> AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, I mean, it, 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 we found at Warm, Warm Springs is a, um, has a big camp that we go to, it's, it's fabulous, but it's in a rural farm area. And so if you go up to the top of this little one hill and you stand on a rock, you can get, I swear, this is not exaggeration, you can get a signal. But now in the old days, when the cell phones first came out, I carried a cell phone the size of this machine, <laughs> and it weighed about almost 20 pounds. And I would take it every day with my equipment in case anything ever happened because the school, we had the, the track, but the school was locked. And so in case anything happened, you need to have a telephone. You always have to have water. You always need to have some snacks because some of your athletes will be diabetic and you need to you know, have some appropriate food. I mean, even with, if, when we get to heat, um, heat illness can cause vomiting and you're going to need, once you've taken care of that, to get a little food back in the stomach. Um, cups, you're going to need because sometimes the bottles won't work, straws, if somebody has cerebral palsy, they can take in a lot more, not everybody, but some people can take in a lot more water with a straw. If you use a cup, half of it's going to spill. Uh, you need to have ice, or ice for injury, but also ice for cooling, we'll talk about later. And then a variety of, I mean, other things like, you know, plastic bags, you know, gauze, and things like that you know about. Um, you always need to have your athlete participation forms. 
and they need to be secured. So you need to know your athlete, do they have seizures? Are they taking medication? Because some medications, some things that they take are respiratory inhibitors. If, it's a, if, it, if it impacts their breathing, you need to know. And you think, I'm not a doctor, how do I know? Look it up. You know, make sure that you teach your staff to look it up. You know, we have WebMD. Um, in, in our office, we have books, we do in-services. But make sure that you or your staff actually read these forms. How long ago did they have surgery? Was it recent? Do they have a shunt? If you have spina bifida, if you're born paralyzed, many have hydrocephalus. And, and I, you know, I want to make sure that our guests from abroad can understand. I, I always talk with my hands, not nearly this much. Um, but hydrocephalus is when your, your brain floats in cerebral spinal fluid, the brain, because otherwise it'd hit the skull and get get injured, you know, it would get bruised. If that liquid, if water, that the brain's floating in inside your head, if too much is made, then you'll see sometimes people where their heads get really big, you know, they may develop hydrocephalus, it's called. But it's easy to treat medically with a shunt, and that is a, it drains the excess fluid, and it dra may, may drain it to a variety of places, the atrium of the heart, where it, it's absorbed in the body. Um, it, you know, it may be other places, it may be peed out. Um, there's all kinds of, of things that can, but you need to know, because if that person has a shunt, they may get a headache, and that headache could be important. Where somebody else, a headache, you might think they're just whiner. <laughs> <laughs> Learning the difference, hopefully not the hard way like I did. Um, personnel, and this varies. Obviously, you know, you need coaches, um, a team physician, that's a luxury, but at least having a relationship with a doctor in your area who knows that sport is appropriate for people with disabilities, that don't think they have to be sheltered, okay? Um, athletic trainers are worth their weight in gold. You know, a good trainer is just, if, and again, there's a great registry it's easy to find them in your area, and I bet you could find someone who would volunteer to be the trainer for your team and not necessarily have to put them on the payroll. And, um, if, you know, if you're writing, if you want a, a copy, I'm happy to give you guys copies of PowerPoints, too. So, in fact, Leah, can we, Mark, can we post them? Yes. Yeah, because what we can do is we can post the PowerPoint and then, you know, that, you know, that way you guys can pull it so that if you want to use it to do an in-service training with your own group, you know, you're, you're welcome to do that. Because our job is to give you the resources you need to do your job even better. Thank you. So, it's, and, and, you know, and all that stuff, of course, is always free. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, the personnel, would a nurse also be someone to consider? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and that was just an oversight, not having a nurse on there. So if there's any nurses, I'm sorry. But I'll tell you the truth. We have had, in this country, trouble getting nurses to volunteer. Um, nurses are in demand. They draw big bucks. And um, it, we, we, we don't have a lot of luck. And, but we have a lot of luck with doctors and athletic trainers and PTs and OTs getting them to volunteer. And so that was just, I'm sure it was just a pure oversight in my mind. Do you have any history with uh, school nurses? And, and do they often volunteer for these things for after school programs? Uh, occasionally, not often. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's exceptions to every, every rule. And I think something that draws people into nursing in this country is 
is that you can get really good pay, you can get a job wherever there's a shortage, so you can get wherever you go and you can kind of, not set your own hours, but you, it, you really, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a good career, and, it, and because you're so accustomed to being paid always, where everybody else kind of is, you know, but that does not mean that there are not exceptions to the rules. And we had one of our staff members' cousin was a nurse, and she volunteered. She volunteered. We would be nursing at the camp. We had nursing 24 hour, and she's great. So yeah, I was recommending Carol that uh, a lot of times you can call nurses, like you said, it was a friend of a friend, or even one of your athletes' parents. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great yeah. to find one of your athletes' parents a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What about a major uh, What about a what? Major What uh, about missing the last word? Medical clearance. Yeah. In the school setting? Where did you get to that? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and all that's in here. Yeah. So as as Bill's been doing this a long time, so you know he's wanting to make sure that I'm getting the right points. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so okay, so you may want to get a medical committee. You want to have a relationship. If you've got a big event, let the local go meet with the hospital, the emergency room. If you're having a big competition just to let them know it's going on. And that'll f facilitate so that the triage, you don't end up sitting in a waiting room forever. Um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, medical emergency awareness procedures, you want to know what your, what your resources are. When we do things in rural areas, then we don't have the resources that we have if we do something in Atlanta. If we're um, if we're helping out in in Cairo with an event, we hosted events in Cairo, we hosted events in Kenya, um, in Tanzania, in South Africa, and it's very different. But you always you know you want to be as prepared you know as possible. So think, prepare, and act. Always think. And later in the conference, you're going to actually get a little reminder that um, in Blaze Sports, we really push um, the, the, the quote you've probably heard, that you want to, to um, think like a person of action, but you want to act like a person of thought. And so you're always thinking about, you know, the you know, action. We don't want to just never get anything accomplished. We want to take action to solve problems, to make things happen. But when you get to acting, always remember to think. Weather emergencies are not to be taken lightly. And certainly, uh, when you think about the South, we think about these major, enormous lightning strikes huge thunderstorms that come up that are very dangerous and they can come up in five, ten minutes time with or without notice. Uh, we have tornadoes in this area that can hit and can hit fast. I had a tornado once come through my backyard and it didn't touch the house but it took down a giant tree that, that ended up taking, taking my deck but not the house. Um, we think about hurricanes and hurricanes not only are a threat to the coastal region, but, but and obviously the Caribbean, you know, and Haiti, but we had a hurricane recently that reached all the way up into New England. Um, my children live in, in New York, they're grown, but uh, my daughter is a captain of the, the the soccer team and they had some freshmen, some new players, young girls, and school had not even started. They had no roommates and all of a sudden a hurricane is hitting New York City. And so she said, okay, everybody, my apartment, 
Yeah. We're having a sleepover because we don't know what's going to happen. And of course, she was well equipped and had been well trained for those kinds of things, living down here and uh, so forth. So Pete, we'll get back to tornadoes, lightning. Uh, do you cancel the event? If you cancel the event, if you cancel practice, what is your system for notifying your participants? Because you don't want them out in torrential rains because some of them will be so dedicated they will. So, um, and Mara, would you keep me on track of time? Because I know it's a long session. Okay, and when do I finish? Oh, good, I'm good. Okay. Um, the spectators, the spectators are your responsibility too. You know, it's not just just the athletes. So when it comes to things like water, when you have extreme heat or emergency care, having a stand where they can go if they're not feeling well, that you've planned for that. You know, again, assigning personnel. You know, you're okay. Here we go. Coach and staff, you must have participation information. You need to know. Your athletes, your volunteers, I mean, not, not your spectators, of course, your staff. You need to know their name, at the very least, their name, their, their emergency information, their emergency contact, if they have an allergy, something that's likely. I mean, somebody can have a peanut allergy, and we don't know it, but at this hotel, maybe they serve something with, uh, or um, we had an episode once where we had shellfish allergy, and we, the, the vendor with the food swore there was no shellfish. Nothing in sort of a mixture. Sure enough, no, it was. Your athletes, you need to know the medical history. Surgeries, seizures, shunts, um, you know, whatever. And ongoing training of staff. You've got to remind them and remind them and remind them because especially coaches, they're thinking about performance. And we have to remind them they're pushing. Coaches push athletes to the limits. And so we have to remind them that they also need to be thinking about safety. We have forms that are in our toolkit. That does not mean that our form is the best form. It's a very, very good form. We think it meets the standard of good, if not best practice. But what works for you, but you need to have the information, you need to have it with you, but you need to have it in a secured place. Don't put it in the backpack and toss that backpack under a tree or in the stands where anybody can take it. You're working with children, and when you've got children's names, children's addresses, children's emails or phone numbers, you need to protect those kids because there are, I'm sorry to say, there are predators out there. And you, it is your responsibility to make sure that no one has access to how to find those kids. Because kids with disabilities are all children are vulnerable, but children with disabilities are even more vulnerable to kidnapping, to abduction, abuse, and it is your responsibility to not make that easy. So if that backpack is not on the back of your staff, then it's locked in the trunk of their car that's close by. Okay? And you got to keep reminding them. I got great staff, but I have on occasion walked into a gym and seen that backpack tossed up in the stand somewhere. I won't tell you who. <laughs> Actually, the who no one works for me. Uh, pre performance exams. This may or may not be possible. If it's possible and feasible, have your athletes get a doctor to fill out a medical form. If it's possible, it's not always possible. In the U.S., in the United States, it is possible. You'll see 
the drug stores will say uh, school athlete physicals twenty five dollars. So it is possible uh, here. It may not be possible in some of our our areas abroad, but to the degree that you can get medical information and. You may want to do it every year. In Blaze Sports, we do it every two years. And then we just check to see if somebody's had a surgery or has had an exacerbation. If your athlete has a progressive condition, let's say they have muscular dystrophy, and so they, they get more and more impaired or more medical complications in a year. Or maybe they have uh, Frederick's ataxia. Frederick's is actually, and the, if they've had a recent brain injury, you know, if they're, if they're six months post brain injury, MS, you know, then you may want it more than every two years. Um, obviously, you know, the things that you're working on, you know, your cardiovascular, your muscular strength your muscular endurance, your flexibility, motor ability, specific sport training, sport specific, uh, warm up, cool down, which as you know is extremely important, the warm up and the cool down, but I've got to point out, oh I have a pointer, I don't have to walk up, okay. <laughs> muscular strength and flexibility. You need to know which athletes have impairments that create brittle bones, osteoporosis. Um, osteogenesis imperfecta is a condition that an athlete is born with that means fragile bones. And I'm not going to get into a long medical lecture, but we have our bones, assuming nobody here has that, have a matrix. They're put together with a collagen matrix. Sort of, you know, meaning, you know, like like a tic-tac-toe board. This way and this way. So, so it's strong. With osteogenesis imperfecta, it's a linear matrix. So it's, it's easy to break. You, you know how karate, I used to take karate, and I always loved that I could go and I could break a board. But you know when you, you know it's dramatic, but you know they never break it against the grain, that you break it with the grain of the wood because it's linear. And so it's not so strong when you hit it because they're in a line and it just pops at the line. And it's the same with somebody with brittle bones. With osteogenesis imperfecta, and just like anything else, they can have it in a very severe form or a milder form. And when, as they become mature, post-puberty, they're a little bit less fragile usually than when they're prepubescent. Then um, if somebody doesn't stand at all, like sometimes uh, you'll think your youngsters are going through torture when their doctors or therapists put them in peripodiums or standing frames because bearing weight will help the legs not become, if you don't use it, it becomes more fragile and helps them keep a little bit of bone mass and so they're less fragile. But if somebody's in a wheelchair all the time, then it's very possible. Again, you may do your lift perfectly. Let's say a two, man or a two-person lift, you do it right, but you could still break somebody's leg. And so you need to keep in mind, you know, what conditions might make their bones. Uh, arthrogryposis is another condition where they're going to be fracture prone. And I, yeah, I've made, I've made all the mistakes. I'm even going to tell you all of them. I'll lose my credibility. Before I actually realized that I needed to read in the study, and I, I have uh, chapters now and three medical textbooks that are medical texts for the doctors, um, general and also physiatrists, the physical medicine, the rehab doctors, 
occasionally have, have chapters in them, and you know, so that they can understand sport and interpret, so that they make good judgments on who can compete and what, where the risks are, and things like that. And and I'm probably educated the same way you are. So that's just strictly doing your homework, going out and reading and learning. We've got great access, and it's worth the time. Believe me, it's worth the time. But when you're working on flexibility, you need to know if there's a medical part of your disability means that they're going to be more fracture prone. And the same thing with muscular strength, not all of your athletes would be necessarily a good candidate for powerlifting. But somebody, some of the best powerlifters have osteogenesis, but not when they're pretty much best, you know, later in, in life. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Um, there's specific concerns based on the impairment. There are different things that you need to be aware of. And so, again, the first thing you need to know, what is that person's disability? And if you aren't familiar with it, go look it up. And, and Leah, do we have in our team kit like a list of good resources? Yeah. Um, um, I've got a book chapter and a book on um, sport injury for youth athletes. And it's all youth athletes. It's a great book. And I did a chapter specifically on uh, injuries and injury prevention for youth with, it's a gold, uh, Goldman, gold, Goldstein book on athletes with um, youth, children with disabilities in sport. And it's written for us to understand, not, not for doctors. The doctor texts are written for doctors, but these are written for us. And also I have a, a, a chapter on uh, injuries, sport injuries for women. And Ann, Cody, and Dr. Richter, and Dr. Ben Johnson and I did a chapter. But even in there, there's some that are related to things like pregnancy. You know, they're just gender specific, but by and large, there's a lot of information that's related to everyone. Um, wheelchair athletes. Obviously, most common injuries are going to be strains and all to the, to the shoulders, to the upper extremities, and chronic overuse injuries, uh, falls and collisions, those crashes when the wheelchairs crash, and overdevelopment of anterior muscles and weakness in posterior muscles. So if you're a trainer, you're going to want to try to balance this out because ultimately it will cause injury. And we're doing a better job now, but you will learn more. If you keep going with your CDSS certification training, you will learn more and more. Because athletes, and I'm sure Ann wouldn't mind me telling you, but Ann Cody, who runs our Washington office, is a three-time Paralympian and is a remarkable athlete. But we didn't know much. You know, shoulders are not meant to be used you know, evolution as our method of mobility. And so Anne has had to have both shoulders done. Reconstruct it's called reconstruction, right, Ben? Reconstructed. And as I go over athletes that are Anne's generation above and below, we find these injuries that are affecting their life, their quality of life, their mobility, their uh, ability to be active now because they were improperly trained. Now, we don't have the corner on that market. When I was a swimmer, 50 years ago, 45 years ago, and I remember the first week of summer we always did double workouts. You know, you know swimmers are notorious for overtraining. Mm -hmm. Before school, after school, this was before goggles. I would go to school with eyes the color of your shirt <laughs> from the chlorine. But the first week of summer, every summer, our coach had us swim, train, a hundred thousand meters. 100,000 meters in one week, the first week of summer. 
to build our conditioning. We know a lot more now about proper training and and overuse injuries and things like that. So you know, just kind of being aware of what what kinds of injuries are going to occur. Don't worry. There's not a test. You're not going to have a test on this, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll explain it to you really fast. Autonomic dysreflexia. Most people refer to it as going hyper. Dan, are there any other slang for it now? AD. 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 They just say AD. Thanks. Um, it's been a while since I've been out there. Autonomic dysreflexia can kill and kill fast. You know, if you've worked in the, in the hospitals, in a clinical environment, you're more familiar with this than if you've spent your career in community. The gist is that particularly athletes that have cervical injuries, your quads, or high thoracic injuries are more susceptible to it. And basically, I think T5 or above, is that, is that right? Correct, I mean, if, if you guys are more, if y'all are authorities, and I'm expert, feel free to yell. <laughs> uh, but it happens, and some of the triggers can be something, conditions, you know, below the level of injury, lead to autonomic dysfunction, include, if somebody's got a full bladder, so make sure that people have the opportunity to bath, to empty their bladder. Um, it can be, you know, a, a full bowel, uh, pain, infection, skin breakdown, even something like an ingrown toenail, uh, sudden changes in temperature. And I have known now quads, uh, an athlete who's quadriplegic. One of the things is that they, and you guys all know about cars, right? Automobiles. And we talk about like if your car, if you hadn't had a tune up and your car idles high, it's when you pull up to a stop sign and you put, or a red light and you put your brake on and your car's going, <laughs> yeah, it's idling high, it's kind of ready to go. Well, some cars will idle on the low. Is there another way to say it? Somebody knows something about cars, is that? Is that okay? Okay. So the, we we say that people, um, athletes, well people, but, but we're talking here about athletes with quadriplegia tend to idle low. So they're, they're kind of, you know, it's, that little bit of low energy, it has to do with the level of, of the injury. But if your blood pressure is low and if you're idling low, it's going to affect your sport performance. So some athletes will actually induce a spike in their blood pressure and their heart rate and so forth in order to perform better. I've known athletes to sit on tacks, to sit on a tack in order to perform better so that they, or leave their bladder full that they're willing to take the risk because their performance will be better, will be faster. Or maybe, I shouldn't say will be, you know, maybe, and certainly they believe it to be, and the research, some of the research indicates that. But they're playing with death. It's like Russian roulette. It ain't worth it. Proper training could make them perform just as well with, you know, without it. And so, Treatment, if you have somebody that, that goes hyper where you think this is happening, then you need to address it right away. You know, you're going to want to, in many cases, please. Finish what you're saying. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I was just say, uh, since we're talking about athletics and stuff, sometimes it's also the extreme positions. That yes. Sports put people in, straps, um, taking, things of that nature that can... Um, increase the sensation um, and cause some of these symptoms to occur. Absolutely. 
And would you recommend that sort of maybe in between events, like loosening straps, maybe even getting people out of their chairs? Yes, absolutely. And it may take effort, but if you can prevent somebody from having an episode, because they can also stroke out, they can die, all these things. So it's worth the effort. And also educating your athletes about the condition and about the risks doesn't mean they can't be athletes. But you need to be aware of it, you need to learn about it, and we have in our toolkit extra information about this. Athletes, there's also cards that they can carry and just um, a lot of physicians, if you went to an emergency room, there's a lot of places that do not still know about this condition. So that's the truth. It's carrying the card and letting them know what they need to look for medically Absolutely. because they can actually be trying to compensate for symptoms that are actually can cause more problems. Great point is that sometimes you go into an ER and you get a resident and they may not pick it up. So the more information we have, and that also gets back to the forms, you know, having the medical form there, having them carry a card, amputees, I mean, the falls are gonna happen. There's this real risk of skin breakdown on the, on the uh, they refer to it as stump or the residual limb. Uh, making sure that the prosthetics fit properly, that there's good padding and friction, that we have the, um, a, a lot of people now are using the, uh, some of the things that elite runners use to, to minimize the pounding that goes on, they're, they're even using in some of the uh, prosthetics. Athletes with CP, um, cerebral palsy is an injury to the brain that is in the area of motor function, not cognition not intellect but motor function but there's a much higher incidence of seizure activity or, or some people refer to it as epilepsy with individuals with cerebral palsy so you need to be aware of that um, you need to know that individuals with cerebral palsy have an increased lactate um, uh, lactic acid production and so muscle fatigue can be a factor in, in training wheelchair users have a much higher incidence of upper extremity strain sprains and overuse and flexibility training and flexibility as part of their training is really important with athletes with cerebral palsy any type of cerebral palsy but especially wheelchair users um, obviously your ambulatory athletes are going to have more injured knee injuries because you're going to have um, the uh, adduction, if you're gonna have, when, when you've got muscles that are pulling in, then you're going to have more injuries when they're doing running sports and they're playing soccer, things along that lines. And you need to be aware of spasticity. We know some, we know some tricks of the trade for spasticity. Um, believe it or not, icing um, prior to a race can actually reduce spasticity. It only lasts about 20 minutes. But, um, you know, little thing, coaching tips like that, that you'll be learning as you take the other levels of, it's not cheating. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it isn't, it's just knowing, you know. Uh, visual impairment, obviously there are no visual cues. Um, there is a big difference between somebody who acquires blindness and someone who's born with blindness in terms of their uh, gait and their gait analysis. If somebody was born with blindness, then I would encourage you to get to do a lot of gait training with them. Um, obviously, biomechanists are a great resource with that. But if, particularly if they're, if you see their biomechanics are different, if they're, they're congenitally blind or if they were blind at a very young age, maybe premature birth and the oxygen or whatever causing blindness, then they're going to end up having some. Um, uh, a, more, a higher incidence of injuries from uh, uh, improper biomechanical gait uh, and crashes. And honestly, I, you don't know how many experienced people. Y'all, y'all go to Mike, Mike Mushet's lecture. Mike Mushet at USOC. I've known Mike a long time, and um, we're related. And I love to tell the story about how he had a VIP 
he was the president of the International Blind Sport Association and he was leaving and they walked through a door and Mike had been working really long hours and Mike walked even to the wall. <laughs> Because if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So prevent thirst. Make sure that they're getting plenty of water breaks and you know, ideally cool beverages if you can if you get access to ice, fluid replacement immediately, and you know, your some of your sports drinks in certain situations can be really helpful, we're in a rush, so um, heat illness is incredibly dangerous. We've got great resources now. It can be something as simple as having a cooler with ice and water, no, not just pure ice, put water in there with it. You take rags, towels, we have some little glaze towels, um, I'll sort of bring in a place some out that we use that are almost like a bath cloth, you know, and you can cool people with it. They're um, a frog togs. Are y'all familiar with frog togs? Um, I need to get some frog togs to, to you guys in Haiti. It's a special, it's almost like, it feels to me kind of like what the scuba divers wear, but it's not the same. But you wet it and it gets cold and it stays cold on its own. And it is a magnificent, all you have to do is wet it, and it gets cold. And it's better than just a wet rag, and they're not very expensive. And so we're using lots of those, especially in the hot climates, or hot heat and humidity. They are, they are fabulous. You need to watch for signs. And let, let me finish this, just because I'm tight for time, okay? And then I'll make sure that we get it. Yeah, Dan, give me the, the, the five, four minute sign. Um, increase, you have an increase in internal body temperature and it is extremely dangerous. Again, people can stroke out, they can die, they can faint, and you want to get them to the hospital right away, but you start treating on site, you know what? Acclimatization. Uh, when possible, if you're traveling with your team to a competition, try to get in a couple of days early so they can acclimatize, whether it's, it's altitude, because you're going to get a headache if you're not used to altitude. Uh, dehydration will be affected if you're used to a humid climate like Georgia and you go to somewhere where there isn't humidity. And you know, the, here the sweat doesn't absorb, so it doesn't cool as effectively. Diabetes is a major problem, especially if you have athletes that are overweight and you need to learn to recognize the signs of diabetes, get people into the treatment, but also, as I mentioned before, having the appropriate snacks, you know, and, and the orange, juice, orange juices, the things that can help immediately when somebody starts to have um, a, a crisis. But you need to know from those forms who has, who's diabetic and who's not. Seizures. There are many different kinds of seizures. Athletes sometimes don't even know they have seizures. Seizures are caused by brain damage. Seizures do not cause brain damage. And so understand that. Also understand that everybody, you, me, everybody, has the possibility to have a seizure. We all have a threshold, and if that threshold is met, we will have a seizure. 
Now, think about the things that can lower the threshold or cause a seizure. And think about people that have a seizure disorder, their thresholds lower. Dehydration can cause seizure. Excessive fatigue can cause seizure. Changing time zones can really mess you up with your medication. Make sure your athletes never pack their meds. They should always be with them on the plane at all times. And the seizures can be huge, grand mal seizures where they lose uh, consciousness. They can be myoclonic seizures, um, a seizure where, you know marionettes, the string puppets? And yeah, you don't want to talk about with A myoclonic seizure is as if somebody just snapped those strings and then these people collapse. They don't lose consciousness, they just collapse. What can trigger that? Loud noise. You know when I learned that? My first year in practice, one day it was raining. So I had my, my students, I didn't read their files, and we did a balloon relay where you run and you sit on the balloon, you know, pops, run back, you know, kid, little kids. First ones, pop! I had three kids in the floor. <laughs> I didn't get it. So I thought, oh, here, we have to back up. Next group runs in, sit on the balloon, pop! Same three kids. <laughs> Something's happening in here. I think it took me three times before I figured it out. <laughs> Know who has asthma. Make sure they've got their inhalers. And of course, pressure sores. And this is extremely important because these can um, end up with severe hospitalization, people losing jobs, repositioning. They don't automatically reposition. Even people that are experienced have had their disability a long time and are used to weight transfers, you get focused on sport and you forget if that sport wheelchair doesn't fit properly. So you need to get your athletes to check their skin for redness, you know, for any kind of beginning of a pressure sore and get it treated immediately by that physician, by that nurse, um, by the expert in the field. Uh, prosthetics. You, know, you want to make sure they fit properly. Your athletes with MS, and I'm not going to go into the etiology because it's a short time period, but be aware that heat impacts individuals with MS and it can cause a setback, and not just for the moment. It can actually create setbacks that they don't recover from, and that includes hot water. Like, you're not going to put them in a hot bath. You're not going to put them in a hot tub. You know, you want, if they're swimmers, you, know, you, need, you need to be very, very cognizant because heat will exacerbate MS. And you also need to be very, very aware of overexertion. That does not mean they can't train, but the length, length of training the amount of training is going to be different. Again, we have resources that we'll put on our website for you for free and links um, where you can get more information and really good expert information that will make your finding those resources easy. And we put the PowerPoint up so that you guys can download it for your own use um, in an editable format. So if there's something you don't know about, you can take out. So thank you. You guys are very, very